I've talked to you about music and musicians, but it's not very often I address the instruments they use. As much as individuals shape music, so too the tools that create it. The choice of an instrument makes a world of difference in the sound of a song, and there are so many elements that affect the decisions artists make when they choose their particular weapons. Sometimes it's by purposeful design, sometimes it's by a limitation of money, and sometimes they just follow what's fashionable. In any event, not all instruments are made equal. Today, I'm going to focus on one of the most overlooked instruments in all of modern music, the amplifier. Amplifiers aren't just generic devices designed to make things louder. Since the introduction of the microphone, amplifiers have had an impact on music. No two designs are identical, otherwise every single guitarist would use the exact same amp. Component choices, wattage, speaker type, even the materials in the cabinets all have an effect on the amplifier's sound. Amplifiers built with vacuum tubes are generally warmer and have a more organic vibe. Power can rise and fall through the circuit in a fashion not unlike running water, giving a tube amp a sense of being a living thing. Conversely, solid-state amps are more precise and efficient, and allow for sound possibilities unavailable to pure tube amps, including computer-assisted functions. And there's even amp modeling, a sophisticated process by which the characteristics of dozens or even hundreds of different amp combinations are made available in a device the size of your palm. When I got started with guitar, I knew straight out of the gate that I wanted a tube amp. Not only did I appreciate the give and take that a tube amplifier can enable, but the technology fascinated me. We've been using vacuum tubes for over a century, and while they've been replaced in just about every other application with integrated circuits, the tech still lives on in music. Much like how there's no substitute for a Stradivarius violin or an antique grand piano, tube amps provide a sound and feel of use that can't be replicated. But I was kind of broke, and tube amps are expensive. So my solution was to just build one myself. There's a vibrant homebrew and boutique market for tube amps online. In theory, all you need is a schematic, a layout, tools, parts, and a steady hand. While the process isn't exactly cheap, it can run anywhere from a few hundred to even over a thousand dollars, the price of a vintage or modern tube amp can be even more costly. Initially, I thought I could just cut as many corners as possible. I purchased a busted old hi-fi amp, uh, you know, the kind for a stereo system, and I decided I could refurbish it into one of the guitar amp designs I found online. So I got it, and my father graciously assisted me in building a speaker cabinet, and this head cabinet, and made it to fit the chassis of a Bell 2122 Hi-Fi amp. But there was one small hitch. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. While the outside of the unit was relatively orderly, the inside of the amp was a disaster. The design was a mess with resistors and capacitors hitched willy-nilly to tag points all over the inside. I would have had to tear it to pieces so I could completely rework the chassis, and by that point it would be almost the same as starting over from scratch. WHAT AM I DOING?! So I did more research, dug around online, listened to recordings, and tried to decide just what kind of amplifier I wanted. And at the end of the day, I fell in love with one particular amplifier. One that helped usher in rock and roll. The 1959 Fender Bassman. Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, The Eagles, Nirvana, Bruce Springsteen, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Pearl Jam, too many acts and artists to name have relied on the sound of the 59 Bassman, circuit model 5F6A. It became one of those legendary instruments crucial to enabling rock and roll to be played live and loud. And either in the studio or on stage, it allowed for the entire genre to grow, thrive, and evolve. That brings up the question, what makes this thing so special? To get an idea of the mythology behind the 59 Bassman, we have to talk about Fender guitar amps of the day in general. Fender used solid pine and birch plywood in their construction. Why? Because it was cheap. They covered the amps in the 1950s in tweed, which was actually a material called twill, but it's known as tweed based on the texture. Why? Because it was cheap. The output transformers and the speakers didn't have the broadest frequency response or reproduction compared to a high fidelity amplifier. Why? Because it was cheap. Do you see a pattern here? 
And yet all the aspects of these amps that were cost reduction measures are now almost deified. People speak to the tonal characteristics of the components involved, overlooking that these parts weren't selected for their sound quality so much as how well they enabled the pinching of pennies. Anecdotes about Leo Fender include references to the fact he was such a skinflint, he even reused styrofoam coffee cups. The amplifiers were built with the lowest cost options at the time, but they're now regarded as some of the greatest ever built. It's the irony of vintage reverence writ large. And then again, even the cheapest 1950s components were solidly built, and assembled, and hand tested. But as mass production and overseas manufacturing ramped up through the following decades, parts became even cheaper. Paper wound transformers were replaced with plastic, solid wood was replaced with fiberboard, and capacitors. Actually, let's not open that can of worms right now, please. No. In general, even the cheapest piece of shit in the 1950s was built like a tank compared to today's even cheaper pieces of shit. The trouble was that for bass, the 50s era basement amps were lacking. They didn't have the frequency response to adequately reproduce bass tones, being weighted more toward the mid-range. Instead of one large speaker, 50s basement amps had multiple smaller speakers. The Tweed Basemen mostly failed in its job as a bass amp, but all of those supposed failings I just mentioned meant it was unintentionally a fantastic and ridiculously loud guitar amplifier. But say you don't care much about Fender. You like metal, hard rock, high gain Uber Alice. Well, in that case, you still owe the 1959 Basemen a great debt. In the early 60s, importing Fender amps to the UK was a costly proposition. Jim Marshall, Ken Brand, Dudley Craven, and Ken Underwood hit on a solution. They'd build their own amps across the pond. But seeing as they'd never done anything like that before, they stole a copy, borrowed the exact design of the 59 basement. A crucial divergence was the substitution of British components and speakers for their American-made counterparts. This led to a few subtle changes, such as a higher gain preamp tube and a brighter bright channel. The result was the revered JTM-45, which became the basis of the Marshall amps to follow. And if you think that's brazen, it happened again. In 1964, Canadian-based trainer amplifiers released the YBA-1, which was, you guessed it, another copy of the 59 Basement. Imagine this kind of thing happening today without every company involved suing everyone else into oblivion. And now we come back to my little project. I decided to make my own basement. And I decided to put a unit with a chassis that's almost two feet long inside this little head cabinet. And I decided I was going to use a 40-watt stage amplifier as a bedroom unit. Did I mention I had no idea what I was doing? Now, let's go over this thing, and yes, it's a disaster. This was my first attempt to cover a cabinet with Tolex and grill cloth, and despite my dad's woodworking, I goofed the end result hard. The amp chassis is simply a sheet of aluminum bent into a U, and it's been modified, drilled, even cut with metal shears in places as I made changes to the design. The inside is a rat's nest. I know, it's very thrown together and the work is unforgivably sloppy. That it functions at all is something of a miracle in and of itself. Furthermore, to solve the issue of using such a powerful amp in my house, I added a circuit called a very wide. It takes the place of the original power bias system and lets me scale the amp. With the touch of a dial, I can turn it from 40 watts all the way down to around one watt while still retaining most of the tone and characteristics of breakup and distortion I'd get from having the amp crank to full power. The only trouble was, I had to squeeze the circuit boards into this tiny, cramped chassis where I could, and yeah, 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 it's a mess, yep. So here we are years later, and I finally decided I'm going to correct these issues. First off, I'll be getting a proper head cabinet, and 
I'll be using this JTM45 chassis to contain everything. The JTM45 is essentially the same amp as the 59 basement, so it should be able to contain every single one of the components with no trouble. Once that's done, I'll be able to service it more easily, and it will have a standard layout that any amp technician will be able to attend to, repair, diagnose if I ever need that in the future. More, I'll have made an instrument that could potentially outlast me. And I think that's kind of cool. So let's get started! Before you work on a tube amp or any kind of valve technology, including old CRT televisions, there are safety precautions that need to be taken. The most critical thing to remember is the filter capacitors in a tube amp, which serve to smooth out the voltage. They're dangerous. Even after being unplugged for a long time, they can store and retain a level of electricity that could instantly kill you if it discharges through your body. To start the work, you need to safely discharge the filter capacitors. Take an alligator lead like this one, attach one side to the metal chassis of the amp, and then clip in a resistor to the other end. I recommend to use a 10K resistor rated for at least one half watt. Next step, put one hand in your pocket. Really, it's not just an Alanis Morissette lyric. It's a little precaution that helps prevent the circuit from being closed along your body in the event of a mistake. And by mistake, I mean, uh oh, my heart stopped. After that, locate the positive side of each filter capacitor. They're usually clearly labeled. Touch the resistor to the positive ends of each filter capacitor and leave it there for 30 seconds. That should safely discharge the electricity. But we're not done. Much like a gun with a tube amp, you should always assume it's loaded. That's why we're going to double check. Set a multimeter to read DC voltage, clip the black lead of the meter to the chassis, and touch the red lead to the positive end of each filter cap. If you've properly drained them, the meter should read zero. Now you won't die! <laughs> Next, I desolder the power supply connections and label each one just to keep track of them. Then I'm going to clip the leads running to the circuit board so it can be removed. Finally, I'll pull the controls from the front and back, label them as well, and set them aside. Now we can put everything into the new chassis. I decided to rebuild the circuit using this JTM45 turret board from Mojo Tunnel. With more room in the chassis, I'll be able to place everything correctly. And here's the new circuit board. Yeah, this, for real, this is a circuit board. This was the technique used to create circuits in the days of vacuum tubes. It's simple, but effective, and easy to repair should a component fail. I also made a tiny change to the circuit to give a nod to the Marshall JTM45, this bright channel capacitor. Marshall added this to the bright channel to give the amp a more bite and growl, so I opted to do the same. From here, I've used a piece of cardboard to act like a pseudo chassis. By mounting my controls in place on flexible cardboard based on the chassis measurement, it makes it easier to wire them up to the circuit board. You want to keep lead wires as short and direct as possible while still reaching their connection points. This helps reduce interference and keeps the interior tidy. Next up is to add the transformers to the chassis. No, wrong transformers. These transformers serve several purposes. A power transformer to convert and distribute current, a choke for controlling high frequencies, and an audio transformer for turning an input signal into an output signal. I've also added the tube sockets as well. Back inside, the next step is to wire up the tube sockets to the filament heater leads from the power transformer. Vacuum tubes are kind of like light bulbs. They work under similar principle, but when the filament is heated, it's not to create light. It allows electrons to move in the vacuum. In doing so, tubes can be used to direct electricity how and where you want it to go, much like modern transistors and diodes and such. Science! One thing you'll note about the wire is how they're twisted in pairs and hanging up and away from the chassis. That's done to reject hum that could creep into the circuit. Fun fact, this is the sound of the feeling you get from using Twitter. Okay, now I've mounted the circuit board in the chassis as well as the controls. It might look messy, but let's compare it to my first attempt. Okay, we've advanced from it looking like a spider monkey assembled it to looking like a chimp assembled it. I'll just call that growth. I also took this opportunity to add some safety features not present on the original layout, like a secondary fuse and some backup diodes on the rectifier. There's some techno babble involved, but it boils down to things that 
don't affect how the amp sounds and also reduce the chance of it bursting into flames. Yes, tube amps can actually do that. I see that look on your face. Stop it. We're almost done, but there's one final safety check. The light bulb limiter. This ridiculous looking thing is actually a very simple and easy tool to check your work. You plug the limiter into the wall, the amp into the limiter, and then turn on the amp. If there's a power short inside the amplifier, the light bulb will come on and stay on very bright, like this. That means you wired something wrong, but the limiter has spared your amp components any damage. If you've gotten the power hooked up properly, the limiter does this instead. It comes on, and the bulb dims down. We're okay! Oh, uh, let me just... It, yeah, we, we don't need that. <clears throat> And here's the amp, assembled and working. But we need one last touch, the cabinet. They take a lot of forms, but essentially they're just a box to put the chassis in to protect the tubes and the internal components. So, here's where I got creative. Believe it or not, this is one of the first guitar effects pedals. Kind of. It's a 1964 Fender Reverb unit. Reverb wasn't always built into amplifiers, and in the late 50s, the surf rock sound started catching on, which relied heavily on reverb. As a kind of stopgap, Fender created this to add reverb to an amplifier that didn't already have it, so they could cash in on that Beach Boy style. I picked this up a long while back, and while it's nearly 55 years old, it still works like brand new. Now let's dig into some design minutia, because I know you kids are horny for that stuff, right? Yeah, I'm right. Fender amp designs went through three distinct eras. The Tweed era, which includes the original basement. The Blonde era, which was in the very early 60s and also had a few brown amps as well. And probably the most well-known era, Blackface. Yes, yes, it's it, the style, it, it's called Blackface. I know. I know! There's also a few sub-eras. One is the later 60s and 70s, the Silverface era from when CBS had bought out the company. Virtually the same looks as the Blackface, but internally, the amp designs were crap due to CBS's shoddy management. The other sub-era was a transitional phase from blonde to blackface. Since Leo Fender liked to save cash, they reused parts and amplifier cabinets during the styling changeover. This one's been given the nickname Tuxedo. Black Tolex and silver grope cloth, but with the white cream knobs of the blonde amps. To get to my point at very long last, I wanted my new amps housing to match my lovely reverb unit, and also acknowledge that it's a blend between the 59 Baseman and the Marshall JTM-45. So I went back to the very first model of JTM-45, what's known as the offset model. By and large, it's functionally identical, but cosmetically different, with a cloth front and the chassis mounted to one side instead of the middle. All right, combine a Marshall with a Tweed Fender, add the Tuxedo Era design, and... Voila! Cream barrel knobs, Fender-style black Tolex, and silver grow cloth mock age to match the fading on the reverb unit. It's nice, it's clean, it looks good even when you're not playing it, and bonus, Here's the original speaker cabinet my late father helped me build, refinished in the same style and voiced with two 10-inch speakers that copy the designs of Fender's 60s-era amps. And just because I hate myself, here's how it used to look. Did I mention I had no idea what I was doing? Okay, I've talked about the legacy, I've talked about the design, I've talked about building my own. So, how does it sound? Full disclosure, I am a very amateur guitarist. It's mainly just a hobby for me, but I can still show off the tone of the amp a little bit. Let's start with a clean setting. Now, here's the beauty of power scaling. When tubes are cranked to high power, they distort, but they do so in a way we consider pleasing. Usually. <laughs> 
This way, I can capture some of the character of the basement cranked all the way to a full 40 watts and do it without destroying half the neighborhood. Some of the character. Some. Not all. It's an imperfect solution, but, well, here for yourself. I'm not Hendrix or Van Halen, but I make myself happy when I play my guitar, and that's all I could really ask for. So what about you? You interested in doing something like this yourself? It's easier than you think. This is the 59 Baseman's baby sibling, the Fender Tweed Champ, specifically model 5F1. No frills, no tricks, just a volume knob and some tubes. It's very simple and low powered, coming in at only five watts. Yet because it's not incredibly loud, it can be cranked up for some sweet warm distortion without knocking a wall down. This amp remains a mainstay of many professional artists and gets called on often for recording. And you can build one! It's considered a beginner circuit, and while you'll need to take the precautions I mentioned earlier, it's very simple to assemble. Multiple companies offer kits starting from around $200. Not exactly peanuts, but still a fun project for anyone into guitar who wants that sweet old style tone. Often people don't consider that everything that goes into the music they love is an instrument. The microphones, the mixers, the computers, the amplifiers, all of it come together and contribute in some small way to the overall sound and feel of the music they create. I love that. And I love the style and the history of these old obsolete beasts. The fact that designs from over 60 years ago are still compatible with guitars made in this century never stops being wonderful to me. These amps help lay the foundation for rock and roll and for all the music to follow, and that's something special. I hope you enjoyed this little retrospective thing. Now, go before the guitar nerds get here and tear this video apart! Run! They will eat your soul! Fly, you fools!